welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Walinga. I'm a professor of communication and culture here at Royal Roads University on the beautiful Vancouver Island in BC. And welcome to our webinar series, Sport, Leadership and Social Change. This is episode 24, where we're very privileged to talk to representatives from a variety of provinces across Canada, and where we want to showcase provincial and territorial safe sport programming. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Lekwungen and Kasepsen First Nations. Our campus is on a beautiful three, over 300 hectares of old growth forest, and it holds so, so much history. And it's our responsibility, of course, to acknowledge our history fully and some of the gaps in our learning that I'm sure we all, uh, we all miss and are all trying to fulfill now. And we take it very seriously at Rural Roads that we uh, take responsibility for bringing into, into reconciliation, into alignment, how we operate on these lands into uh, the values, into alignment with the values that we uphold in Canada of respect and, and diversity and unity. And even though we're not responsible for actually the, the harms committed, we do need to take responsibility for repairing that harm. We spend a lot of time on these campus grounds and we take advantage of the wisdom that they have to share for us. And I often frame these webinar episodes with this kind of thinking because truly there's truth in sport, of course, as well, and a great deal to learn from sport, especially as we navigate some of the challenges that we're facing in sport. Let's use sport to help us. I want to invite you to participate in the chat. I see a couple of people letting us know where they're coming from and, and who they are and what they what their roles are. That's great. I always also like to highlight this beautiful bridge on our campus. It's such an emblem for my school of communication and culture, but it also represents another principle that sport teaches us that before we can bridge the gap, we need to mind the gap, understand the differences between the sides that we're trying to connect and understand and appreciate the value of diversity in our learning and our development as human beings. At our university, we uphold three very important concepts. And one of them is that learning must be applied. And again, I see it echoed in sport that we're constantly, it is an education, isn't it? Sport is another degree, I think, uh, that it's all about being caring and community-based. And, and we really, um, embrace that in our model with our cohort model, but also our residencies where we bring people together to meet each other before we invite them to learn while they're learning in other realms online. And our main focus is that it's all about transformational transformation, sorry, that you go through personal transformation and learning, which enables you to then facilitate transformation in others and across our, our uh, world, our communities. There is truth in sport, which is why, I mean, I love sport. I think it's one of the most engaging. We know it is one of the most engaging endeavors. It's the most watched thing in the world. So it has a powerful, powerful influence, but it embodies the fullest of human expression, like art, literature, dance, theater, except it also adds this, this competitive factor. It teaches us how to challenge one another in a productive and respectful way. And we've seen the way that our athletes and, and members of our sporting communities have taken up their platform and their communication channels to really fight for change, positive social change in sport in all sorts of different ways. Our programs try to represent and reflect these same kind of principles. Uh, we care about development, diversity, education, the environment, equity and human rights, health, communication and community building and peace. And we also partner with many sport organizations, including Game Plan, where we, we actually align with a lot of the same principles, where we acknowledge the learning that athletes have gained through their uh, sport experiences and how that has really cultivated leadership within them and prepared them to give back to society. We see so many great athlete leaders out there helping uh, and helping in sport as well in Canada. 
And we've also, I'm right in the middle of this course, actually working with a lot of the CFL players and working around sport leadership and we're developing programming around governance and, uh, and its impact, sports impact on society as well. But today we want to focus on what's happening within our provinces and territories. What's the, the programming that's taking place to navigate some of the challenges we're facing in sport and particularly around safe sport. Most of you who, of course, who are on this webinar really care about sport. And so I'm sure you've been following the stories very closely. But I wanted to take this opportunity to think about the role that our provinces and our provincial sport bodies play, but also uh, what's going on in Canada. I love being able to promote and showcase. So I welcome several wonderful panelists today. Leanne Trainer is the uh, Sport Development Officer for Sport Manitoba. And we also welcome Andrea Wools. She's the Safe Sport Manager for Via Sport in British Columbia. Sorry, I've got a capital V on there. Andrea, I'll change that. Uh, it's supposed to be through sport. And I love that because uh, most of my webinar titles have been in and through sport. So we want to address things that are happening within sport, but also through by learning from sport, right? I also welcome Alana Lieberman. She's a safe sport lead for Sport Nova Scotia. And we were hoping to see Sylvain Croteau today. He is uh, the Director General with Sport Aid in Quebec. But I will share uh, resources related to all of the provinces and territories. We weren't able to invite everybody today, and not everybody was able to make it, as you can see. So that's fine. We will highlight other things that are going on across Canada, uh, some very interesting and someone said to me you know Quebec's 10 years ahead so I really wanted to try and showcase what was going on in Quebec as well but we'll get there. Uh, we always invite people to post comments and questions in the chat and I'll be monitoring that but I know the panelists can keep an eye on that as well and we will weave those into the conversation we might invite you to actually speak your question as well turn your mic on we'll have to ask Nancy so I want to acknowledge Nancy's here from uh, Rural Roads um, who is uh, supporting us technologically, but also monitoring that chat, making sure that you all have the technical capacity to contribute if you need it. We have to be fairly careful with these more public forums. We've been uh, bombed before in Zoom, so we, uh, that's why it's kind of locked down. But just let us know with a, a reaction, a hand up, or a post in the chat that you'd like to have an opportunity to speak, and we can make that happen. All right, so let's let's get going. I always want to start by inviting our guests to share a little more about themselves. I've given just a, you know, a title of what, what their role is within their provincial sport body, but please tell us a little more about what you focus on, but also how you have found yourself in sport, what um, keeps you in sport, what keeps you motivated to work for and on behalf of sport, and who would like to start. Great. I can start. <laughs> uh, my name is Leanne Trainer. I have worked for Sport Manitoba now for just over 17 years in uh, um, multiple different uh, capacities. Um, but I basically grew up in a curling club. So curling has been my sport. My whole family plays it. Um, I played competitively here in Winnipeg in both the juniors and in ladies and mixed and became a coach. So that's kind of my sport, but I've definitely participated in a lot of others. Um, but I really love about working in sport is um, I was a regional manager previously with Sport Manitoba. So I was right out there um, in the communities and I really loved seeing the success, working with athletes and seeing the success that they had um, moving forward in their sport careers and just being able to play a part of that um, to, help, to help them on that road is, is, is really, you know, makes me really enthusiastic for my job. But thank you so much. And how about Alana? Would you mind going next? Thanks. Sure. I'm happy to. Thank you. My name is Alana Lieberman um, and I use the pronouns she and her. Um, I, uh, I have a long sports story, so I'll try and make it brief and I'm sure some people have heard it in other webinars but I am a free or I was not am I was a freestyle skier and it's a sport that actually no longer exists really um and it was the ballet and all the the fancy things that are now memes um and that's was sort of my introduction but I grew up in a sport family um fast forward a few years and I became a lawyer a child protection lawyer 
um, in Toronto and then moved out to Halifax. And again, fast forward a lot. That's what happens when you get old, you get to fast forward a lot. Um, and there's a lot of stories in there. Um, but uh, when the position with a uh, safe sport lead with Sport Nova Scotia opened up uh, three and a half years ago, I jumped at the opportunity to um, marry my passion for sport and um, with my child protection background. And um, that's how I came to the position and what keeps me in this position and what keeps me doing the work um, and so inspired by the work and the people around here. And I recognize some of the names and, and colleagues who we work with regularly. Um, I think that my drive is leaving a legacy for that positive sport experience. I had a, a wonderful sport experience um, growing up um, and I want my children and my grandchildren and my community's children to have that same positive sport experience um, that, that I had and that I know that, um, and we all know that how wonderful and how incredible uh, sport can be and the, the amazing benefits of sport. And, and that's sort of what drives me and keeps me going every day and having discussions with a lot of the people on this call. So that's me. And Andrea. Yeah, those are hard stories to follow. <laughs> um, I always have a hard time with these introductions because um, someone once described me as a Swiss Army knife, and, and I think that's actually a pretty good description. Um, I was a, a physiologist, so uh, a scientist. I've been a, a support services manager. Uh, I, I grew up as a dancer, and I had a fantastic experience in, in dance. Um, uh, I've been a coxswain for a rowing team. Uh, I've been a board member of a provincial sports organization. Um, yeah, I, I've done a lot of things. And uh, A, sport's been fantastic for me. And, and B, it's also been horrible for me. But I, I didn't hit horrible until I started working in it. And seeing the way that uh, some people were were through what they were put through whether they were staff or athletes um really uh it, it, it's just upsetting and it shouldn't be like that it doesn't have to be like that and so i've been trying since about 2000 to figure out how to fix it and so same as elena when i saw this job come up a year and a half ago i just laughed at it um, because i think we're finally in a position where we can do something and i feel like we are doing something and i'm really hopeful and positive so uh, that's what keeps me doing this. It's the same idea of leaving a legacy for the next people um, and, and not just in sport, outside of sport as well. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. And I see that thread linked all the way through, right, in service of others and wanting to leave that legacy and protecting others, always thinking about, you know, how can we make this great for everyone? And I think we've all had really positive experiences. I often recount I've had I, we, I counted up how many coaches I had with my daughter once because we were talking about, well, how, how much have we actually experienced this kind of uh, abuse? And out of 30 coaches, you know, since I was a little kid up until even recently, uh, none. I've had zero, right? So such a positive experience. And um, but we're seeing not so necessarily, I don't think uh, sport has changed all that much over the many decades but we've definitely seen the issues of abuse and violence and discrimination be brought more into stark relief. Um, I do think people have, are done with the misogyny and the patriarchy and the discrimination. <laughs> and it's great to link arms with you all to, uh, to try to fix it. I like that phrase, Andrea. So my next question really is around, let's talk about the concept of safe sport. It's relatively new term. Uh, I think we've used quality sport, true sport, all these other kind of concepts. But what do we mean by it, really? Let's get that on the table. And uh, you talked about how, you know, distressing it was, Andrea. Let's talk about what it is we're really seeing and what we're trying to fix. And why do you think it's become such a priority? We'll get to that as part B. And please, again, to our attendees, weigh in share your thoughts as well. We can weave that all in as well. Who'd like to start there? Just And just turn your mic on if you're ready to jump in and I'll notice and make sure it happens. Andrew. I can I can jump in because I spent a lot of time when I first got the job trying to figure this out and Leanne and, Leanne and you on our collaboration network calls. We, we have a, a group 
across Canada who get together and bounce these kinds of questions around, uh, which is really helpful. Um, is it, what is it, this safe sport thing? It's, it's uh, if we let it be, it's an amoeba that grows into every corner and takes over everything. And so for, for me and my role, I've narrowed it down to um, physical safety and psychological safety. So those two pieces, and there's obviously subcategories and subcategories, but those are the two, when I'm talking publicly about what safety in sport is, those are the pieces that, that I find uh, are un understandable for people. I think when we make it too complicated, yes, it's about safe, accessible, welcoming, inclusive spaces. It's about positive culture. It's about all of that. Uh, but when you get down to it, that still doesn't tell people what it is. So for me, it's anything to do with psychological safety or physical safety. Thank you. Hello. I can just, yeah, I can just uh, tail on. And I know, Andrea, I remember those initial conversations uh, trying to come up and have people across the country come up with that definition. And and um, I guess personally, um, we've done some work with uh, with uh, people in Nova Scotia and, and recognized very early on that safe does mean a lot of the word safe and safe sport does mean a lot to a lot of different people. And I've taught a safe sport course at Dalhousie um, and we spend the first two weeks in our course talking about the notion of safe and safety and safe sport and comparing and contrasting. And I think where I come is sort of almost, I, I recognize Andrew, what you're saying, absolutely. Um, and, and I've written about it and talked about it, but um, you know, so much right now is talking about maltreatment and harm. And for me, and, and sort of the platform by which I do my work and, and lead some of the work that I do is that safe sport, this concept of safe sport is more than the, the absence of harm. It does include those inclusive, welcoming, um, accessible uh, environments. One of the things, just I'll throw it out there, but uh, we talked about it. And, and, and in that definition, I've included fun. And uh, within my course uh, work and asking some students, some students have question whether sport is fun, but I, maybe we can pick up on that, Jen, later on, because I bet you have <laughs> some thoughts, and I know we've spoken about it, but I thought that was really interesting. But again, for me, it, it is those those concepts of uh, inclusive and welcoming, accessible and fun. And I have to agree, uh, I'm, I'm probably a little bit newer to the the, the safe sport work than Elena and Andrea are, but but it was definitely one of those topics that around the table in Manitoba were like, we need to kind of have a, we need to define it because everyone is kind of defining it as something different. So um, that's, we have basically defined it as an environment where individuals can have a healthy, supportive and respectful sport experience free from all forms of harassment and abuse. Um, and hopefully, you know, it's one of those things where you want to be inclusive enough, but, but also have drill it down to what, you know, manageable and um, areas where you can actually make some improvements. Yeah, wonderful. And um, and I love it when we do try to define what we're fighting for, what we're working toward. It's not just about abuse free, right, or absence of harm. It's these things we're trying to actually create and build. Um, and and in doing so, also keeping in mind the prevention aspect. Uh, what do you think's made it such a priority? Like we're we're hearing about it nonstop lately in our sport world, which is a pretty big world. A lot of people are concerned right with this even if they're not directly involved in sport so how has it become how has it grown how has it become that amoeba that's going into so many different corners what do you think's going on there i i can just say that certainly when i started um and and talking to friends and and family and what i did i it, it there was sort of like what what are you talking what does this mean and and it was but now and well i'm gonna say within the last year it, the, that explanation is no longer necessary. And unfortunately, I think we're seeing the rise in this discussion. We may have all been involved and known about it before, but I think, uh, honestly, um, the, the major stories, the, the hearings, I think that has brought it to the forefront, which is really interesting, too, because some of the work we do is not necessarily about the stuff that goes on, although it is, I guess, big picture. Um, but I, I really do think that in the last year, year and a bit, 
that notion of of safe sport has has changed in terms certainly in terms of the public's perception of what that is. Okay, and Andrew. Oh yeah, absolutely agree. And I think what I've seen happen over the last mm, it's been probably twelve years now, either abroad or here, is it's down to people. It's down to a journalist deciding that this is a story they want to tell. And that happened in Britain. Um, and then it's, it's happening here, it's happening all over the world now. Um, I think because the media companies are learning that they're, they get good engagement, but also there's stories to be told. And before these kinds of things, you know, you complain to your organization and it would be dealt with or not. And I think people just got so frustrated, athletes in particular, um, have got so frustrated that they went to the media and the media started looking, but it is, it's just down to people. It's down to people who want to tell those stories. And then it has this other impact, right, Elena, where so much of the focus is on maltreatment. And yeah, absolutely, it's a huge priority, but uh, you know, the flip side, the positive side of creating positive culture, there's so much work we can do there. Um, and, and so we, we actually published a position statement on safe sport this year at Via Sport. And it was incredible through all the different iterations, how many times we had to pull it back. Like, okay, wait a minute, we need to widen this out again. We're getting too narrow, we need to widen it. So it's, uh, it's an interesting balance between, between the priorities. Leanne. No, I think safety is, in sport has always been important to people. I think it's, I think it's just that people in stories of what has actually happened to people haven't come to the forefront. Um, so those people who haven't had those experience think, okay, well, there's, there's no reports of these things. So everything must be good, right? There's, you know, so I think like the others have said, you know, the, the, the publication of these breaches of safety that are being brought forward are, are, are really, I think, shocking and appalling people that it is happening in, you know, sport across the world. Um, so. I think, I think that's really what it is, is people are feeling more empowered. Um, people are coming forward to support um, people with telling their stories. Um, and that's really opening the eyes of the public. Outstanding. And the real tipping point being that communication platform accessed and then supported by the media. Love it. But it starts with those humans just having had enough. Hey, <laughs> and uh and it's tough that it has to come to that point. I, before we get into talking about the specific initiatives underway within your various uh, domains, and I wanna make sure that we share as much as we can within this webinar, but we'll also share these resources afterwards. So we're gonna capture anything that's shared in the chat or anything you wanna send to us later on, that's great too. And, and same for the participants, if you have things you wanna share that are happening within your, um, your associations, your organizations, uh, PSOs, PTSs. Uh, before we get to that, though, I want to ask, you know, along with those participants, those people you're trying to protect and or build a future for, build a safe and supportive and healthy and fun place, what is it you're trying to protect in sport? What are you working to save, rescue, recreate, Go ahead, Andrea. Sorry, I keep barging in first, but I'm going to use Elena's word, fun. Gosh, it should be fun. You can compete and be really super serious and still have fun. Where is all the fun gone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep going. What do you mean by that? And where do you see the fun dribbling away? Or what are some examples of what you're, what you remember the fun looking yeah. like? You know, my, my, experiences at the sort of Olympic level working for, for British Cycling and then Cycling Canada, you know, initially you, you'd go away to races and you would actually interact with people from other countries. You know, you, you, you hang out with them, you, you know, there was a party after the competition, there was whatever, and then slowly fewer and fewer countries were allowed to go out because, you know, incidents happen. <laughs> people, have, we know what it's like at that level, right? People end up in jail. Um, somebody peed on a check-in desk, um, you know, it, it happened. So it, it just got shut down and then suddenly there's no social engagement. And so it's that, um, 
the, the bonding and connection that people feel, I think, has just been policied out of the system in a way. Um, and it's, you go into these performance environments now and, and people aren't just expected to be behaving like professionals, it's that fun is seen as unprofessional, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're goofing around and being silly, you're not taking your sport seriously. And if you wanna make it, you have to take it seriously. And that just means everybody's grumpy and miserable all the time. And who wants to do that full time? Who even wants to do that part? You know, it, it, you should look forward to going to your training sessions because you enjoy being there. You should look forward to competitions. You know, it's your peer group in a lot of cases. And I would just love to see that come back a little bit. And it really, I love that um, insight you have that we've turned fun into something like the enemy almost, that it's a sign of weakness or it's a sign of lack of professionalism. It's, it's a tragedy. Uh, we lost a teammate recently and the photos that we were sharing had nothing to do with competing. They had everything to do with all of the stuff we did in between that was absolutely goofy, silly craziness, right? That kept us all very connected and, and like sisters. So how do we reclaim that? Beautiful, thank you. Who else would like to share a little bit? What are you trying to protect in sport or rescue or reclaim, rebuild? Leanne. Well, I think I don't think I have to tell all the people who are attending this webinar that you know the importance of sport. And so in a way, I think it's we're almost it's like we're trying to protect the the reputation of sport and the positive things that it can bring to someone's life. Um, I, I think we, the last thing I want is for people to be hearing these types of stories that they're hearing in the media and saying, oh, well, the sport is, you know, they become afraid of putting their kids in sport because that is a potentially bad environment. Um, and I don't want people to be afraid of, of engaging in sport because it has so many great positives that, you know, it's not something you want to miss out because of, of a fear of the potential of maybe something happening, right? So, I think it's we have to make it so that it's 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 not taboo to talk about safe sport, um, and that you know people just feel warm and in a welcoming environment to take part in sport and not have those those fears surround them. Because if they're not signing their kids up, what do we lose? Right, we're losing all that participation. We're losing then the benefit for society. It's quite a tragedy as well. And Alana, what are your insights on this or perspective? Well, I, I think Andrea and Leanne said them perfectly. So I like combine my answers. And, and thank you, Andrea, for picking up on the fun because I, I had some interesting discussions with those students. But, um, you know, I, I just from a personal, you know, some of my connecting with people on Facebook after not seeing them for 20 years, 25 years, um, and having those positive memories. And, and Jen, as you said, um, thinking about the things that we did outside of sport, the travel and the places we got to go and and the and where people are now and what they're contributing and to be able to say, do you remember when? And hey, I know you and 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 just those connections that we make throughout our life. And and then as Leanne said, those positive values that we we can or those positive, yeah, I guess values that we get from sport and leadership and participation and teamwork and all of those things. And if we lose that, then we are losing, as you said, Jen, those those valuable uh, contributions to society. Um, and so I think, you know, again, a combination of, of what you what you've all said, really, um, and and creating that legacy so that we do have kids continual like continuously signing up forever um, and having that positive experience. Can I can I add on to that? I love that. So many people in this space are so focused on the athletes and young people because that's so important. I think it's a huge part of, of socialization as you're growing up. I also would like to focus on the people who work in sport being able to have fun. I do some leadership coaching with somebody internationally and um, it's, this is a big topic, right? There is no fun. She, yeah, I, I would love to go into details and I can't. So let me think of how I'm gonna frame this. I think you're right, Andrea. Motivation. I think, I what is know, the motivation think, to go yeah. into your place of work if there is absolutely no joy in being there? And, and I want that for everybody who's on this call. I want you to look forward to going to work. I want you to look forward to interacting with your board 
with your participants, with everybody, with your, your staff, right? I want that for all of us, not, not only for athletes, yes, for athletes and everybody else. Love that. Thank you. And yeah, because it's about sport participants and that's everyone, officials, volunteers, the parents, the spectators, anybody who has anything to do with it. Right. And we should all be striving for excellent experiences that are, uh, I would say from little league to major league, right. With beer league in the middle. So important. And the other point was that, you know, that legacy idea and the values of sport and, and Andrew, you touched on too, that you're seeing kind of a disconnect globally. And we used to train with, we lived at one of the uh, German, our German competitors, family's home. <laughs> That's where we lived and stayed. And then we trained with them. You know, all our secrets are exposed. No secrets. They're going to find out on race day anyway. So you might as well just share it. And the point is we're helping each other. We're supposed to help challenge each other to be better. So it's really distressing for me because the whole point of the Olympics is that it's a world community that we're losing sight of those values. All right. So um, what are we doing about it? What's happening? And let's first start by describing the approach that your provincial body has taken to Safe, safe sport. Many of you have talked about, you know, we're, we're addressing cleaning up sport, but also this idea of building something that's going to prevent harm, but also something that reclaims some of those values. What's the decision making that might have led to that approach? And then you can share as much as you want about what's going on within your hood. <laughs> Who'd like to start? It's a big one, a big question. And a reminder as you think. <laughs> I'll go. I guess I I guess on this this uh panel, I guess I might be the most senior, which is so interesting. Just from the people who are did not necessarily well, I'm probably also the oldest, but um, but uh anyways, um so I think the first thing that Nova Scotia did is they hired a safe sport lead. So that was uh that was good uh three and a half years ago and or almost three and a half years ago and so that was their initial commitment um and um you know a lot of this uh you know some people talk about buckets some people talk about initiatives you know i guess being the only person right now in this position um certainly within sport nova scotia um i sort of frame it as you know right now and maybe as this conversation goes on, I'll change it. But you know, we're we're talking about maltreatment and complaints, and that's sort of the nature of the work has has sort of that's one area. And then there's the other aspects and the other initiatives that um, that I do to. It's almost like to further that that initial discussion about what safe means and what safe sport means. And so some of the work that I do with a number of people on this call um, or who I can see their names, um, you know, we have our ambassador program, our true sport um, ambassador program, which um, I saw Liz earlier, but I am so proud of, and we are already talking about year three, which is, which is really, it was an idea uh, that came from an athlete summit that make, Foster. Uh, sorry. So again, there's there's so many connections in this, which is which again I had as a note, which is really fabulous. Um, so our athlete ambassador committee, which um, or athlete ambassadors, excuse me, who um, promote true sport as a way of as a an approach to safe sport. So I, I'm super proud of that. And again, I'm focusing on these because we could talk a lot about um, the the complaints process and we might get into that. Um, the other thing that we uh, again are super proud of here is our athlete advisory committee. And so we struck that um, when I first started and we had initially seven athlete um, advisors or on our committee. And from that, we helped to create Safe Sport Month, which we have every October. We created, we just released over the last six months, a series of podcasts that were created by, the topics were created by, they were involved in pre-production, production, post-production, post everything. Um, and these topics were generated by our athletes. And we've just opened up um, and about to close the second round for our athlete advisory committee. And I think we had an overwhelming 35 um, athletes apply from across the province, which blew us away. And the level of commitment and passion to safe sport and changing the narrative was was remarkable and so we had to narrow that down to nine so we'll be uh, announcing that shortly and it'll be our second uh, group of athlete advisors so 
that is changing some of the narrative and moving forward. And we don't know. I mean, we take we take what the athlete advisory committee says and what what do you want to work on? What do your call it? What do your peers? What do you what do you see as athletes in the province? So really focus on um, on what the athletes are asking for. And I know that exists sort of at the national level um, and we try to bring it down to the provincial level and community. So super proud of that. There's a few other things, but I'll stop and let my my friends go. No, keep I keep going, keep yeah. going. Oh no my goodness. You know, I think it's good for us to be in Nova Scotia and be thinking about, okay, this is all the stuff that's going on there and everybody on the line can be stealing away. <laughs> Well, steal, well, stealing, well, and that's sort of actually one of the other points, uh, feel free to steal, but more important, and I know there are some colleagues from the East Coast, feel free to collaborate. And um, mm -hmm. I know that we're on, I'm on true sport calls, and we would love to see something like this in other provinces and other jurisdictions. So, you know, we're always here to reach out and provide, you know, I don't know, templates or just discussions. And I really feel that um, with the collaboration network that Andrea is, uh, I don't know if you're <laughs> you're you're running that show, but we're there to support you, Andrea. And, and I think that's really, really amazing. And and for us um, at the PT level to get together, um, we have a similar version, um, which predated that for the Atlantic region. Um, I saw Jamie on here earlier, and I think that's really, you know, we it does silo it a little bit, but it, it allows us to get together regularly to talk about what are we doing. And I think that's so important. And the more we can share and collaborate and Let's take ideas from each other. I know that uh, we have an EDI conference and we're using some of the resources that uh, Via Sport has given to us. And I think that's so important because um, what we do in Nova Scotia, yeah, it is Nova Scotia specific, but it absolutely can be adapted. And I know that the people on here are willing to share um, and to collaborate. I think we all are coming at this from, from the same, <laughs> same or very similar reasons and um yeah that's what drives us that's exactly the reason for this kind of a, a platform too right it's let's showcase people will make those connections they'll see things they like they can now they have a person they can go to to learn more about that and we can collaborate i love your point too about we are diverse and we're in all these different provinces and territories with different legislative approaches and laws but uh that's okay I, I think silos are only dangerous when the walls are impermeable right when we're not actually sharing so as long as you then reconvene uh in the larger group the more national group and share what's been discovered you need that time in a smaller group too to figure stuff out right and talk about your own unique challenges thanks for sharing all that and i see liz just pulled up the the link too thank you that's exactly what we want to see who'd like to go next telling us about what you're working on and, and before I forget, Andrea, I also want you to give us a little bit of background on what prompted or how you uh, initiated this, the collaborative network around safe sport as well. But we'll get to that. Go ahead, Leanne. Tell us about Sport Manitoba. Okay, in Manitoba, we thought that there's there's a lot of focus right now at kind of at that national level of reporting and, and dealing with those complaints. But it's it's safe for sport is so much more than that. So we have kind of our framework has kind of <laughs> evolved to kind of include three kind of categories that awareness uh prevention and action um so we are kind of working within those little silos as to how we how how we can move things forward so in general we just want to ensure that participants have access to those resources and support services that they that they need um we also want to you know make sure that people can recognize bad like bahd bad behaviors and so that we can react to it we you know we want to empower them to be able to step forward and um i think so a lot of our awareness um work has been kind of providing some of those types of resources um and i know some of those resources we we've, we've stolen from other provinces <laughs> and redeveloped which i think that we're all here a fan of um, because we are all working towards the same same end goal right so um there's only so much money that can be used towards safe sports so let's make use of it the best way we can and you know if we can work and collaborate together that's great i know that um elena mentioned her ambassador program and i can't wait to talk to her about that <laughs> because i have interest in potentially doing that here and that's something similar here in manitoba um 
And so um, I'm really for all of that in, in sharing those resources, especially when Andrea has a few different resources, I think that we've already already used as well. So, um, but we basically, we hired uh, Megan Foster. Um, she was a contract position to work on Safe Sport for our kind of our first year within Safe Sport. And it was really geared um, a lot towards working with our provincial sport bodies and, and, and trying to get them to wrap their heads around what Safe Sport is and how, you know, what is their Safe Sport plan? How are they going to make things better for their their athletes and when what they can do? And I think, I think that there's a lot of them that are still struggling with that. Um, a lot, you know, some some of those provincial sport bodies, they're getting information from their national bodies, but some are not. And they're, I hate to say it, but they're, some of them are, are floundering a little bit into how, what their role is and, and where where they can be, you know, the most, what can be the most useful tools that they can provide. Um, and so, um, we're trying to help them with that. So now Megan's finished her position, her contract position. So now I'm taking over um, this the, the safe sport portfolio at Manitoba. Um, and so I'll just kind of touch on a few different programs that we're doing that um, that I'm we're really proud of. We since back way back in 2007, we've been kind of working with <laughs> in safe sport before it was really safe sport. Um, and then we had um, our, our, our safe sport support line. Um, there has been many iterations of what it's been called, but really in the end, it's been the same individual who, who is receiving those calls from parents, from athletes, from coaches, from whoever, and who are looking for advice as to, you know, hey, are these things, you know, is this, is this normal? Is this behavior proper? You know, where can I get help? And, and just being that resource for some, that anonymous resource, uh, where they can they can talk to you and get help and be pointed in the right direction potentially where they can you know access those resources. One of the other things we've done is uh, we worked with Respect Group and got the the Respect and Sport program going. Um, so that's a coach module. Um, that's all basically all about about um, being respectful and and. Um, basically educating coaches on, okay, well, if someone discloses to you, you know, what do you do and, and different things like that, but better preparing coaches um, um, for those types of uh, experiences they may um, encounter. Um, and now that's something that we've actually in Manitoba, we've made a requirement for all active coaches is that they must have that uh, respect and sort of respect and sports certification and they have to recertify every five years um, so that it's something there's always, you know, the environment is always changing, so we want to make sure that they these things are are, are in the, the front of their their brains when they're um, when they're when they're coaching or when they're participating. So, um, and kind of related to that is this year we um, did a promotional campaign related to our our safe sport line. Um, so we created QR codes that people could scan so that the, the phone number to the support line went directly in, you know, into their contacts. Um, and so I talked to our media folks yesterday and they told me that we had over 28,000 people added um, that, that contact to their phones. Um, so we also did uh, venue signs. So there's like 617 venue signs across 300 um, plus communities in Manitoba. Um, and as far as the social media aspect of that campaign, we had 4.9 million social media impressions. So I think that's really important for us is just getting, you know, people aware of what safe sport is and, and making sure that they have that line so that they, um, you know, you, we talked to people previously and not necessarily a lot of people knew that this line was was out there and available to them. So I think we've made great strides in that this year. Um, to make that more available um, to everyone. Um, we had uh, another new program. It's a Safe Sport School Champions event um, that we held in partnership with MHSAA. That's our Manitoba High School Athletic Association. Um, so it was an event where um, high schools could invite um, two or more athletes to come and attend. And it was hosted by um, Allison Forsyth. Um, who was great, I have to say, it was amazing. <laughs> um, but we had um, presentations, um, the Winnipeg Police Service, um, they're doing free presentations, community presentations right now on uh, sexual violence and assaults. And so they did um, 
one focused on the social media and technology. It was a little bit more focused towards that. Um, and then uh, we also had, well, Allison spoke about her experiences. And then we also had Dr. Sandra Furby talk about um, gray area behaviors. So overall, it was really, you know, it was a really great event that we were thinking was more geared towards the, the athletes, but it was amazing how involved the, the coaches that were there with them um, were interacting and learning and asking questions. So it's, um, it kind of, it made us stop and think that, okay, we, maybe we need to do something more for coaches because they were just right in there getting involved and, and asking questions and thinking about how they themselves can modify how they do things um, within their own plans, you know, and how they, how they work with their athletes or even, you know, things like driving, you know, athletes to events was a big one and that they're like, okay, well, we need to talk to my, you know, our principal, our school division and, you know, to say, this is not okay. We need to, you know, adjust to this. So um, we definitely plan on um, running similar events again. So, um, and I'm hoping that this is maybe an area where we might be able to connect a, a potential um, athlete ambassador program. So we'll, we'll talk, Liam. <laughs> Um, but that was really well, so we hope to continue that. Um, and then I really like to um, applaud our partnership with Sport Law. Um, so this is more geared towards governance side of things, which is also my portfolio at Sport Manitoba. Um, but we worked with Sport Law as they worked with many other provinces to create um, a governance suite of uh, templates. Uh, policies. So we've worked with them on creating one for Sport Manitoba, um, which we provide to all of our sport partners. Um, and so we require some of those policies right now. We're just in, we're introducing those safe sport policies to our, our sport partners. So there's a code of conduct and ethics, which is already we require um, from them for funding, but then introducing them to um, the, the coach screening, the social media use um, policies and guidelines, the whistleblower policy, and then generally just the, their general safe sport policy. Um, so we've been we've been happy to have um, sport law, the folks at sport law on board with us throughout that and they help us uh, us as well as our PSOs on legal advice. Um, and uh, they've been assisting us with any of these safe sport um, issues um, until we've implemented uh, a potential new third party uh, mechanism. So um, we look forward to continuing our partnership with them. So, and right now we're, we're just in our, our plans for this coming year of what we had planned to do. So I'm, I'm pulling all the information I can from all the other provinces and all the great ideas that we have, but I think that until there's some consensus nationally, I think that so we're just the best bet for all of us is to continue working together and, and pooling our resources and, uh, and really getting some good resources and product out there. Love it. Learning from sport, right? Reaching out, linking arms. Love it. And Andrea, maybe you can give us an update on BC. An update on BC. Um, I mean, I... <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot. How do I start? Um, we have we have four pillars of safe sport, and probably people on this call might have heard this before, but I think it's worth going back to. And these were defined before I started. Uh, and they're, they're prevent, report, respond, and uphold. And because the report, respond, and uphold stuff was all on hold last year, well, things are emerging and plans are being done and. Oh man, everybody knows how much how much work is is required behind the scenes for this stuff. Um, the big focus has been on prevention, which is where I would love to keep it. Honestly, we need report, respond, and uphold. It has to be there. Uh, but prevention, uh, wouldn't it be better to just prevent it from happening in the first place? You know, how good would that be? So um, yeah. So the the gaps that I found, I did a big lit review, I talked to a lot of people, um, you know, worked with the, the collaboration network people, um, lots of different approaches. What I really saw was that people don't know what's okay and what's not okay. And then they just don't know what to do about it. They don't even know if they should do something about it. And so that was my real focus. How can we solve for that this year? And in, in a different way than other organizations are doing, because why do we want to reinvent the same thing that somebody else is doing? Let's try and plug different parts of, of the holes in the dam. 
So we stayed away from developing online training modules, those kinds of things that are being done, I think, pretty well by, by other organizations. And we focused on um, just general awareness and understanding, same kind of approach that Leanne talked about. Um, we hired a promotional company, a creative agency, because what I, what I saw out there was a lot of safe sport toolkits on websites, and it's just a bunch of links. And, you know, I work in the area and I click on maybe the first three and then I get bored. So I didn't, I didn't want to create that. And it doesn't matter how good the resources are if nobody knows about them. And we're not going to, we're not having a lot of luck feeding things down from the top down in the system. Um, we need to, we need to create pressure from the bottom up. And the only way we're going to do that is with public awareness. So um, we developed PlaySafeBC. .ca, uh, which I can, somebody can type that in the chat. I can in a minute otherwise. Um, and that's really just a, a, a central landing page that we've created that links out to all of our other work. So that was a big piece of it. Our promotional campaign is now live. Hopefully you've started seeing some of it on your social media. Um, there's a, a couple of videos. There's some static assets. There's our, our own sort of social media posts around education. All of that stuff is, is for sharing. I'm going to just pop one other link in here. If you want to check it out, we've, uh, from our communications department, they've collated all of those posts. There's one document. If you can just look through it, it makes it really easy to reshare. So if you're interested in any of that, um, that's where that is. Um, the other, the other real hub to this work was the development of a tool to help people figure out what's okay and what's not okay and what to do about it. And we've called that the flag tool for sport. And you can get to that from the PlaySafeBC.ca page. Um, and it's how can we create a safe place where people can, can find out for themselves if something's okay or not without having to put in any information, you put in nothing you just keep it all in your head. You don't type your name. You don't do anything. We don't track anything on that site other than the number of users. Um, we've had, I think, easily over 20,000 people on it so far. And our promotional campaign only went live not long ago. So um, yeah, we're, we're getting some pretty good feedback on that so far, which is exciting. Uh, we are also doing an impact study which Jennifer knows all about, uh, to try and measure, are we, are we reaching people publicly? Um, not just asking people in the sector, but are we getting this message out there, right? Because what we wanna do, BSBoard's role is to try and elevate sector capacity, right? Our, our partner organizations is 71 times the work if everybody does it themselves. And so what I'm really trying to do is create things that are useful for our sports organizations, for their clubs, and useful for everyone else as well. So anyone in, in, in sport and recreation in BC, but really to try and lift some of the, I mean, it's big hefty work and not all of our sports organizations have a communications person even, you know? So it's, it's reasonably easy to reshare, repost things that are already created. Um, it's a lot when you start asking people to just, you know, here's a template, customize it, do your own thing with it. It's a step too far. So. We're just trying to make it as easy as possible for this information to get out there. Uh, a couple of other little things that we did this year that I think went really well were uh, we customized some training with Right to Be. We're based down in the in the states. They do bystander intervention, usually for street harassment, but they're branching out into all kinds of other things. So we customized bystander intervention for sport training, and uh, the feedback and the the metrics from the surveys afterwards were. Phenomenal. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. Like, when do you ever get 100% of people saying, yes, uh, there's something I can do when I see something? Like, 100? Nobody, that's crazy. 97% would recommend it to a friend. I mean, come on. So we're, we're looking to continue that. But same as Leanne, and I'm sure Elena as well, we're, we're in that stage. I always say, why does year end have to happen at the same time as year beginning? <laughs> Like I'm doing all the year and stuff, I don't have time, but we are, of course, um, doing quite a lot. So I'm working on strategy and, and budgets and working with government and all that kind of stuff. But I think there's there's quite a lot from last year that we want to continue building. 
And the goal this year, instead of creating a lot of new stuff, is going to be reaching more people with the things that we have already. And then a real focus on a, on a complaints mechanism for, for BC, whatever that looks like this year. Did I answer the question, Jennifer? Yeah, let's I remember what the question was. <laughs> um, yeah, you did. You absolutely did. And, and we really want to just hear lots about what's going on so that it sparks everyone's thinking and ideas. You're also all talking about, you know, what led you to that, that idea of efficiency and making sure we're not recreating wheels. We, we're a team. We, let's work together on this. That's great. And good to hear that echoed again. The tracking that's going on. That's about accountability, right? Is this actually working or are we just checking boxes or looking good with our optics? No, we want to do real things and act, which exists uh, in, in all of your, you know, the nomenclature that you're all using is kind of echoing the same concepts as well. But it's fine to have different ways of saying things because that sparks different ways of thinking about things as well. Um, the idea of promoting and raising awareness, equipping people, wonderful to hear just how engaging these initiatives and programs uh, are for people. I think people really do care and want to figure it all out. The balance, this this actually links back to, I think, what you were all talking about, you know, the joy of sport and reclaiming that. And you need to feel that in working in the area too. So it can't all be on cleaning up. We don't always want to be cleaning. <laughs> it's really wonderful to be building and being creative and thinking of these and problem solving, right? Thinking of how we can structure our systems in a way that are going to prevent the harm and uh, and literally create beautiful, excellent environments for everyone. All right. So we have a question in the chat. So let's just step off of my little script for a bit and explore that where Chauncey's asking about parents and their impact on all aspects of sports. And I know there are some programs across the world, but across Canada for sure, like what not to yell, right? That tries to educate parents. So what, what can be done? What are you doing within your province? Are you doing anything? Why, why not? What's getting in the way? What do you think also? I know I'm asking a zillion things, but say whatever you want. What is actually contributing to, do you think, to this, this pressure we're feeling from parents or the the abuse people are experiencing from parents, especially officials, but their kids too, right? There seems to be a, a strange impact and involvement. My husband calls it the adultification of sport. Uh, anyone like to comment on that? Liz, I, I'm putting Liz on the spot. I think Liz is still here. I know that true, uh, CCAS has a the, the Ride Home campaign. I don't know if that's... Um, if if you, I don't know if Liz, if you're here, but if you can maybe populate that because that's something that we use. I know that again in the the class that I teach um, at Dalhousie, this was um, parents' involvement and parent behavior was a huge. It was supposed to be an hour, and we ended up spending like two weeks worth of discussions on this. Um, I guess my only other comment is I actually have a meeting um, with a researcher to maybe start exploring this uh it's on monday so if you can stay tuned to what we might be doing in nova scotia about this uh, i might have another update but this is a, absolutely chauncey uh, uh an issue it's a real issue um it, it negatively impacts sports and rec in so many ways and um i think awareness too i think um i think about some of the you know, we're, we're starting to do, or we've been doing, and we'll continue to do some of the restorative uh, justice work, which I didn't highlight, but certainly can later on, but if we have time, but um, to me, this is one of those areas where maybe, you know, um, it's almost like holding up that mirror um, and reflecting. Uh, anyways, that's, that's sort of not a, a non-answer, and Chauncey, I apologize, but I see your hand is up, so. Yeah, go ahead, Chauncey. I think Nancy might have to give you the power to speak. Um, but yeah, a couple of thanks, Liz, for posting those links as well. Go ahead, Chauncey. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm I've been involved with governance. Um, I'm currently with the minor hockey association with Halifax Hawks. So Elena, I'd love maybe to chat a little bit more. We are actively losing volunteers because of harassment from adults. Um, so it's more than just officials. Volunteers are the foundation of amateur sports in Canada, and without them, we don't have sports, um, is the reality of it, especially in a smaller province like ours, um, especially in our rural communities and others. And, and I'm in the, uh, in, in the biggest part of, of Nova Scotia, but 
Uh, I know we'll probably lose three volunteers this year from one family alone. Um, so it's it's those aspects of, um, I think there's a protection of our volunteers. And I don't know if Scotia hockey has an abusive parents policy and procedures now, but it's really an alternative dispute resolution policy. It's not necessarily, it, it still requires a lot of work and it's much more with regards to that restorative justice components, I think, in trying to create resolutions, which I'm all in favor of. I work in post-secondary and student affairs. So uh, I know all about that piece as well. Yeah, it's just, it's one of those, it just seems to be, and I don't want to paint everybody with the same brush. There's some amazing parents out there and we can all, I think that's what keeps most of us going from that perspective. But um, the respect and support piece is really interesting. If you want to register your kid for hockey, only one parent has to do it. Mm. And so, you know, it's it's little things that I think we could make some shifts in that could encourage that it's for everyone. And not just for probably the person taking it in your household is probably the person who doesn't need it. Um, if there is somebody who's actively choosing not to do it. So um, maybe some small shifts like that, but uh, interested in, uh, I'll probably reach out to uh, Elena as well, um, separately outside of this. Yeah, thanks, Chauncey. I just, I just, I, I, yeah, everything you said, absolutely. And volunteers, I think we, we really need to, to protect our volunteers and remember why they want to volunteer because they get a lot of joy from participating and being involved in sport, whether it's with their children or or not. So I think that that point is really valid. Um, and I think awareness too. I think that, uh, again, I, I, I sort of, I haven't sort of flushed this idea, but this holding the mirror and the behavior, and we talked a lot about this in my class, is that, you know, you wouldn't behave in this certain way in a board, in a, in a meeting at, at your work. So what, what happens, and, and this is some of the research that, um, I want to do is what happens when you whether it's stepping into a rink or stepping into a court or or what what where where does what's that shift and 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 how did we get here and and so um yeah I, I think awareness of of the impact and 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 so I think there's that that sort of holding up the mirror again I'm gonna sit with that for a little bit yeah really good point Andrea yeah, just to, to build on that, this this was a lens that I that I thought of a lot when we were developing the flag tool and the promotional campaign. Um, and it, it came up a lot in the bystander training as well, is that those environments, people walk into them, and because nobody for years has done anything about it, people think it's okay. And nobody feels like they have the power or the responsibility to say something to someone when they're when they're behaving terribly. And so the flag tool is a way for people to explore that. One of the questions, one of the six questions in the flag tool is, is it appropriate in context? You know, would this be appropriate in your workplace? Does that make it okay in sport? No. And so people can start to explore, well, maybe, maybe that's not okay. You know, if you're sitting in the stands next to somebody who's shouting junk at your kids every day and you just don't know. Like, where is the line here? You can find the line. And then, you know, the, the, the intervention training is really about ensuring that everybody knows that they are empowered to do something and that they offer five different approaches to being a bystander. Only one of them is actually approaching the person and, and confronting them directly, right? That's not safe most of the time for most people. And maybe, maybe you just happen to be, you know, a big, strong, tall, person who feels comfortable doing that, that's awesome. Maybe that's the place where, where you step in, but there are five, four other things, four other approaches. You can document it, you can, you can, and you can delegate it, you can, you know, connect with the person who's being harassed and just let them know that that wasn't okay. And do they need any support, right? Like there are all these other things that you can do. And so gradually that's the idea with the public awareness campaign is everybody in the stands needs to know that this is the approach, that this is okay, this isn't okay, and that, yes, you can speak up, right? Because as soon as one person speaks up, somebody else is going to chime in. Um, and so it's really this, this culture change of saying that just, just because you're in a, a hockey rink or a wherever doesn't mean you can say these things to people, right? It's, it's not okay. It's not okay here. It's not okay anywhere. But it's going to take, um, it's going to take the, the community to do it. It's not something that we can just mandate from the top down. And I don't think any amount of training, mandatory training is going to fix the problem. 
And Leanne, do you have comments on this of what you're seeing in Manitoba? Or what are some of the responses you've tried? Well, this is actually an area where we've kind of identified a gap in Manitoba. So it's something that we're kind of um, trying to just focus on now is, is how do we how do we best educate um, parents? And it is, you know, okay, well, like you said, would you act here the same way you are in a rink as you would in the boardroom? Probably not. Um, and we really love the idea of the bystander training. Uh, I know a few of our staff have taken, uh, take, took it when uh, Andrea offered it. Um, so uh, we're definitely looking into that, but uh, I, I'm taking some notes down here as the other two are talking is uh, <laughs> things to, to, to mull in my head too is over uh, how we can potentially use those types of things like turning that, I really like that idea of, you know, turning the mirror on their own behavior and, you know, you know, taking a, a good look at your at yourself and how you are how you are behaving in those environments. Yeah, I'm imagining a whole other promotional campaign of you yeah, know, me too. <laughs> my boardroom, and then I'm yelling at the. Hook. We'll take it on. We'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just and Chauncey may if, if Chauncey's still here, and I could be wrong, but in my mind, I believe that in Cape Breton they thought about or they did institute a fifth official in hockey games to be in the stands. And now I could be dreaming, but maybe to deal with this kind of behavior, which is so fascinating from a, yeah, it's fascinating that we are, we are there. Um, and again, I could be dreaming. So I apologize if I am, but I, I can confirm. I'm seeing something here. I'm going to put in the chat. Um, and, and, you know, I think, yes, there are these responses we can provide the training and extra official to uh, address it. Uh, I've watched people be wonderful, uh, really step up in an environment. I watched this very mild mannered principal walk over and, and lean over almost like he was speaking to a little child, uh, to a parent who was being completely obnoxious and just shut it right down. It was gorgeous, but it took real courage. And, but he's also in a position of leadership, which helps, you know, so how do we support that? And many of us congratulated him on his actions. But at the root of it is this, this, this norm that it's okay to freak out in the middle of a game. <laughs> and maybe it's the energy. I know in basketball, I just think it's so fast that it, people's adrenaline gets the best of them and they start losing it. I mean, that, that NCAA women's final, the the one coach in the sequence, right? She just loses her mind and is on the court for most of it. And we applaud it somehow. Well, the public does. So how do we shift the norms so that we really are acknowledging how to behave in a, in a way that's actually embodying the principles of sport as well? What can help? What can help? Parents pledge. Good. What else? Ideas? Andrew. Our, our creative agency, their, their strategy, I was so blown away. They asked for so much research. Like they just dumped so many documents on them and they get it. They understand the issue and they understand the need to frame this in a positive way. But the campaign they came up with was all about these boundaries, right? And so we've got these word pairings on either side of a line. You put one up on, your, on the slide at the beginning of the slideshow, the belonging and then bullying on the other side. Like one's a shadow of the other. Um, and so it's helping people understand, like, yes, there's excitement in sport. And yes, there's these positive things. And they come out as, as passion and all these other things. But, but when you take them too far, they cross the line, right? And so just it's awareness, it's understanding what the issues actually are. And, and what, you know, what, what surprises me endlessly is that the media focus is on athletes being abused by coaches when actually athletes bullying other athletes is a massive issue. It's much bigger. Um, so, so an understanding, I don't think we can go from awareness to acceptance without understanding somewhere in the middle. And so that's going to be a real focus for, for me this year. Um, and then, and then action, just really empowering people to, to take action. I think sometimes we overcomplicate this, you know, we make it just so much more complicated and scary than it needs to be. And people constantly say to me, oh, you know, culture change takes decades. And I, I don't think it does. I think it happens in an instant. It happens the instant somebody in the stands turns around and says, it's not okay to speak like that. That's it, it's changed. Cause that just set the tone for everybody else. 
right? So I think we're we're expecting this this shift to take forever and to be really difficult. And I think let's expect it to be quick and easy and and approach it that way. And that's not me being naive. Honestly, I know this is a big lift and, and a ton of work, but but for me, framing in that way in my head helps me look for those simple solutions. Yes, the will might take a while, but I believe as well with you that, um, and you're getting some applause from Chauncey there too, that, yeah, it doesn't have to take forever. And I think that's just an excuse to drag our feet again and, and hang on to these patriarchal principles that keep this power imbalance in play, which is what disempowers those from speaking up. They're so afraid they're going to lose something, you know, whether it's an athlete, a coach, an official, whoever, a parent. So how do we return sport to that partnership? It truly is where people feel empowered to, to demand the correct um, principles and values. What's it going to take? And I love the idea of being curious. I try to really set the rage aside and be curious and understand these phenomenon, uh, how, how, what's on, underneath it. And, and Chauncey mentioned, you know, the... The, how expensive sport has become as well, which exerts more pressure, more is at stake, you know, the shift in the resources aren't there to support so much as we're, we're chasing them. That's really going to shift people as well. It's always about power, isn't it? All right. So um, what else can we talk about today? Um, we've been focusing on lots about the complaint systems. I wanted to get back to prevention. So, so equipping, empowering language, you know, being that champion in the stands that's going to shift that culture in a moment and set the tone that's going to be different. Uh, the promotional work we can do. How do we, what, what else? What can we do to prevent the harm from happening in the first place or this mindset or this attitude of power over dominance abuse? And please uh, weigh in in the chat too. I can almost always talk, but I'm just going to leave my mic off because I talk too much. <laughs> no, it's fine. Jump in, you know, and build off and riff off of each other. And leave your mics on as much as you want. The complaint, uh, the prevention. The thing that really stands out for me, if we're looking for training for people in this area, there is an amazing free 23-minute course on protectchildren.ca. It's called Commit to Kids. There is a three hour long one that frankly um, is quite hard to get through. It's up material, but the free one is really exactly this. It's framing protection and prevention in a, in a way that is understandable and practical and really highlights the importance of speaking up for these, what did you call them, Leanne, gray zone behaviors? For, for us in the flag tool, they're, they're yellow flag behaviors, boundary transgressions, intervening at that level is where we do prevention that that is the work because if you let it go farther than that harm has already happened and you've missed your chance and it escalates it gets worse and worse and worse the more you put up with the more people do so um that commit to kids course i really recommend i think they call it their foundation course it's just a video 23 minutes it's so good it's so good um yeah i mean that's that's it's free it's easy it's quick uh, so that, that is one of the, the training modules that I, I do actually recommend to, to quite a few people, because I think it, it explains to people why people don't report, right? We're, we're relying on people to report what's happening to them. And, and honestly, people don't, they don't want to, it's not safe to, uh, often they don't realize what's happened to them until years or decades later. Um, so if we don't prevent it, we're not going to know what happened. So I, I think it's it's a really nice frame in the chat. Thanks for posting that stuff, Francis. Thanks, Francis. Excellent. And so much, there's so many good, so much good training through CAC as well. And so many organizations across Canada really working. It seems the awareness is the challenge, as many of you have highlighted. How do we make those visible and equip people with those? I think governance is another area where um, you know, if you don't have the actual rules in place, it's tough for people to point to something, which is very empowering when it's very clear what the rules of engagement are. It's easy for someone to go, hey, you're cheating, right? Or breaking a rule. 
So um, having, and values, I speak about values all the time, but being really clear as a community, a club, association, what, what we actually want to uphold here. And it doesn't have to be a whole list. It can be two things that are really central to everything we do. And that equips everybody to be able to say, hey, that doesn't align with what we say. I want to highlight a story a very young coach said to me or told me about bullying. And he said, the way I think about bullying, it links to the line concept that Andrea shared um because i really struggle with this gray area i think it's very clear it's very black and white you're either bullying someone or you're not so he said for instance when if someone's late and you ask them to drop and do 20 you're bullying them it's going to tip into bullying very easily and quickly because right away you've pushed them out instead of pulling them in so it's what a beautiful concept i took it from immediately embodied it because if, are you pulling them in or are you pushing them out how could i pull them in if they're late well you're late and that had an impact on the team because they had to pick up the slack. How can you return that to them? Rest restoration, right? Or rest restitution, not retribution. <laughs> and uh, what a great concept. So I wanted to share that. What else can we be doing to structure our environments differently? So people will say, oh, we got to look at our hiring practices. I struggle with that because these are groomers, right? So we let people in because they groom us into thinking they're magnificent. And we're all susceptible to that. So how do we then structure our environment in a way that prevents them from even knocking on the door, walking through the door, or thriving once they're through that door? What helps? Jen, I think to that comment, I think values, uh, discussion of values, uh, hard look at values. Um, I think that to, to answer that question, um, I have a comment about um, training and, and sort of raising awareness, but uh, I'll maybe Leanne wants to go in terms of. <laughs> go ahead. Elaine. No, I, I just think I just think uh, the comments earlier, you know, there are some amazing and I agree the uh, commit to kids training is is fantastic and, and the CAC puts out great training and um, modules. And I think a, a lot for me, really eye opening this year is awareness. And um, again, I, I go back to this course that I taught at Dell. And, and the reason I go back to it is because um, it was eye opening. I, I and I said to Jen yesterday, Nicole, I learned more from this course, I hope, well, I don't hope that than I think I may have given, but I, you know, it certainly was mutual learning. Um, and this normalization, we spent weeks and weeks of talking about normalized behaviors and, and whether you talk about parents or coaches or and what we've normalized. And, and a lot of the uh, young people in this course, it was a fourth year course, sort of put their hands up and said, you know, I didn't know that that was not okay. And it's just the way it's always been done. And for their last project, they, they talked about tools and we, we had a safe sport tool and a lot of the tools that they created focused on educating younger people, whether, you know, and, and educating young, the young people that this is not okay, or, or this is the behavior you should expect. And so maybe, I, I don't know, talking about or reframing that normalization of behaviors, I think is really important. And maybe it is sort of focusing, we focused a lot, uh, or maybe we should start focusing on, on athletes. And that's sort of where I'm coming from. And I, I want to focus on a little bit this year or a lot. We'll see. We'll see what what everybody has in store for me. But that's uh, and that's sort of, I guess, where we go with our athlete advisory committee, with our ambassadors and changing. And this is the behavior and these are the values we protect in sport. And these are the behaviors we want to see. And and mental health is important. Why we did a podcast series. So really sort of changing some of that narrative. I don't know if that helps or. Yes. Love it. The bottom up leadership. Right. And they're calling for then what they expect. Excellent. And they know what to flag because they don't know. That's like, when you watch these horrifying documentaries about about experiences athletes have had. That's what stands out to me is that they thought this stuff was normal, and we need to we need to educate them. Um, I had a crack at some athlete videos last year. I'm not happy with where they're at right now, but um, I'm revisiting them. I actually was was reworking them yesterday, and I think it's too important for me not to put that back on the table and try and do a good job of that. Um, it's, I get parents reaching out to me fairly regularly and now I've got people asking me to do presentations to groups of athletes and I think it's too important. They need to know what's normal, what's not normal, what should they expect, what should they do? 
right? Those kinds of things. And it doesn't need to be scary. Remember, we're not trying to scare anybody. It's just, yeah, look after each other, right? Make it fun, take care of each other, community, stewardship, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what we saw coming out of our, our the, the Safe Sport Champions event that we did with the kids, right? Because they were like having that, that moment of realization that, oh, that's, they're not supposed to do that. Like coaches aren't supposed to do that. And the coaches are, some of the coaches are like, I'm not supposed to do that. Like, so, <laughs> so, so they're, they're definitely like that, that awareness, that education is happening. But in, in that event too, we also saw them, okay, it's like, okay, now we can identify that these are, are, are not appropriate behaviors and they need to be changed. But it was like, okay, but the question was, is it now, how do I, now what do I do now? How do, how do I go to my coach? How do I stand up to my coach and say, this is not appropriate? Or how do I go to my principal and say, you know, this should not be happening. You know, so it's, it, it's, it's really awareness is one thing, but helping empower them to make those next steps is a, a completely different thing. And that's, I think I'm trying to wrap my head around is how do we, how do we help people feel empowered to do that? Whether that's an athlete, why that that's a bystander, whoever, right? So, um, so if anyone has any ideas, if feedback, <laughs> love We're to hear. Done. Leanne, we, uh, we, uh, no. I'm working with someone um, at the CSIA. We have a presentation at the Atlantic Coaches Conference, I think, on May 6th, and we're going to sort of do a this is what's not okay, UCCMS wise, and sort of accepted and the mental performance coach uh and and some of the coaching uh supports are going to say this is what you can do instead so i will keep you posted i, I feel like we will be in touch <laughs> and i I've, I've been working on a slide um sort of adapted from the bystander intervention um training the specter of maltreatment and what i've done is i've gone through the definitions from the uccms and done like yellow flag red flag black flag to give examples of specific behaviors and i also want to build out a a whole page for green flag behaviors, right? And, and make that available. But how we do this, my son, my son's 14, so he's in high school. And, and I was asking him about this one day. And he said, you know, you need to start a rumor. I said, what are you talking about? He's like, look, everybody in my school knows that teachers aren't allowed to keep you after school for more than 10 minutes, if not allowed. And I was like, how did you find that out? He's like, people just know there's a rumor went around. Somebody's, somebody's parent is a teacher and told them and it just went around the school like wildfire. And now if the teacher says you've got to stay and it's more than 10 minutes late, all of them together say, nope, you can't do that. Can you imagine in sport, coach says, okay, so-and-so was late, everybody drop and give me 20 and they all just go, nope. <laughs> That's how we change this. It's the kids, it's, it's totally the kids. It's, yeah. Um, Francis also pointed out that, uh, and thank you for those links, Leanne, Francis Priest from CAC is mentioning, you know, we know, we know the expectations, but they aren't written down necessarily. And, and that concreteness, I think is very crucial too, because then the kids can point to it, they can, or even reference something that they can't grab, but they know exists, <laughs> right? That's great to see, very empowering. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be a, a challenge. Where should it be coming from? You know, everywhere, or is there a way to consolidate some of this expectation? Oh, um, I'm going to ask Nancy. Can you unmute Francis Priest, please? She just wants to weigh in on some of this stuff. Thank you. Yeah, where should the communication be coming from? Where should we? Where would people typically look for? Are they going to their provincial? organizations do you think yeah I think it's a good place right it's our home Francis are you with us do you want to chat a little bit about expectations and I am I am that sports culture is uh there's a lot of the unknown right and so if you've been in the sport you know it but if you're a newcomer coming in you don't know the rules you don't know what you can do or can't do and so we need to treat it more in terms of your orientation and sort of means Right from the get go on the bat, the governance, they know what they're doing. They know how to support them, the coaches and the admin staff, the volunteers that are coming in, the parents. You came in, here's what we expect of you as parents in this sport. Here's how it looks. Same with the athletes. And I think when everybody is on board and informed, 
they know their role, it's easier, easier to say, hey, this thing goes so well, this is how we need to do it. And it's being part of that solution, right? So it's not me coming in and say, hey, you're a bad parent, you're not doing this well. It's, hey, we need to change it better for our kids, for ourselves that, that are in sport and et cetera. So I think it definitely needs to be a better progress in terms of going across the board. Um, on a national level, level and a provincial level, there's more support. So I think there's been some work done on that side, but on the club side, it's hard when it's the same individuals are invested in it. And so hard just to change that idea um, and some of the training and some of that support there too. So I think there needs to be, and it would be great to have some of that linkage between the sports. So from national to provincial to regional and club, because um, the clubs are looking up and saying, hey, I'm ready to do something, but I don't know what to do. And so that's where we're looking at how we can support that. And so we've been working, uh, and I say we in terms of CEC wise, We've been looking at that responsible coaching movement and seeing how we can help with that framework and I give that structures to those clubs. We've also been working with uh, CCES for that true sport initiative. And so if you've got the framework and you've got the values, then you've got those tips there and we're redirecting them to their provincial sports. Work with them, ask the questions. They've done this before, they know this. And so, you know, be patient and be willing to, to do some of the work. But again, uh, I think if we all come in together and keep asking those questions, and then, so these are questions that I get regularly, just from parents coming in or from coaches coming in and saying and going through. And I um, share some of your resources that you, you shared here for sure. And I keep telling them, keep asking the questions, keep going and see for the change, you're part of the change. So don't just come in and saying for the complaint, it's be part of that change and help out for, for, for that future for sure. So it's possible, it's doable, <laughs> one step at a time. And this is the lesson I've gained from the, the day together with all of you. Thank you. And thanks for those words. I think it's a good way to finish off. Francis, I think, um, you know, it's possible. We are the change. We're all responsible and we can be very efficient and effective in how we address some of these challenges. There's some great resources. So I'm thankful that everyone was able to share and thankful to all our participants for joining in for those who signed up. But even when you were here, uh, you know, take the recording and share it widely, because I think these are really valuable conversations, but also resources and human beings that are powerful resources in themselves. So thank you all to our panelists and a big shout out to Nancy Prevost, who's one of my uh, big supporters here. And we will be partners going forward and we'll see you next time. I would like to invite people and I'll put out a, an invitation widely to our um, our audience to give us some ideas. I'm already hearing a few, so it's happening very organically, but ideas for the next topics we should be tackling on this webinar because we're going to be doing some planning. So take care all, and thanks again to Leanne, Andrea, and Elena for joining us today. Bye-bye.